Welcome to another edition of the Giants Little Podcast brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the New York football giants. John Schmelk with you. And now we're joined by someone that has as much front office experience in the NFL as anyone. He was with the Vikings from 2006 to 2021, general manager from 2012 to 2021. He's Rick Spielman. Rick, how are you? It's, it's, it's great to have you on the show. How are you? Yeah, John, I appreciate you having me on today. So I look forward to our little chat coming up. Yeah, it should be great. And and now you're doing a lot of work for Sirius. You're doing some work for, for CBS online, right? What else are you doing? Yeah, I have about four or five different, uh, I guess, uh, side jobs, as some people like to call them. My wife calls them hobbies, but I have <laughs> plenty going on to keep me busy. And I really enjoy doing the media side of it. Yeah, and, and you really are doing a good job. Before we get to to cut, Dan, I wanted to have you on, on today, specifically a day before uh, the final 53s kind of get announced, or the initial 53, I should say, to get into the nitty-gritty here. But first, I want to get your take on the one piece of news from over the weekend. Giants straighter for Isaiah Simmons sending a seventh-round pick. Wondering your thoughts on the move, but more specifically, when you evaluated Simmons coming out, we talked about him a bunch on our shows here. How did you view him and what role you think best takes advantage of his skill set? Well, when he was coming out, there was no question about his athletic skill set, his size. The question was, what is he? And how do you implement him into your defensive scheme? So a lot of times when you are sitting there and you are in your draft meetings, uh, we would have the defensive staff in there when we're covering the defense during the day and the head coach. And we can recognize the talent as evaluators, but then it's up to the coaches to tell us, how is he going to fit in our scheme? How are you going to utilize his skill set? So, for example, if maybe as a stacked linebacker, uh, he may not be as instinctive or doesn't take on well, but he's a great athlete in space. How would that fit into your scheme? And if we do draft him, just so we make sure the best we can that it's not going to be a failed draft pick, uh, we have to know, you have to almost have a game plan when you draft an athlete like this and how you're going to utilize it. So uh, last week, there was more than one phone call going on between probably Arizona and, and New York. There's, I remember that all 31 teams were either contacting us or we were contacting them on potential guys that were at the bottom end of the roster, guys that they may be heavy at one position that they're trying to move or trade. And a lot of times it'll also depend on where you're at in the uh, claiming order because it yeah. goes off the original draft uh, claim or order from last year's draft. So if you're picked in the 20s or that's where your slot selection is and you want to maybe uh, claim a guy and you have an idea that there's no way you're probably that guy is going to ever slip down to you then maybe you start doing these trades, what we've been seeing over the last couple of days. So it's probably the busiest time of year um, as you get prepared for the 53-man cut down because it's the last time that you can really adjust and maybe some fill some holes on your roster on the back end. But getting back to Isaiah, I thought it was a great move by the New York Giants. Uh, and when you watched him a little bit in the preseason game, I got an opportunity to watch a little bit of that. The one thing that's the easiest thing to do is rush the passer. And I saw a few times that they did bring him off the edge. And he will get implemented and learn Wink Martindale's scheme. I know Wink is one of the top defensive minds in the NFL. And when he gets athletes like this, I'm sure that they will have some kind of game plan for him. And I know Joe... And, and and Coach Dayball and all those guys, probably before they made this trade, watched all his tape, uh, even though, uh, and then just say, how are we going to utilize this guy? And it's another chance for us to get maybe a guy that didn't live up to his first round talent uh, to get him on our roster. And let's see if we can find a niche for him uh, with his unique athletic skill set. Just from a mechanics perspective, if you have a player, let's say I'm going to put you in, in the shoes of being the Cardinals and you're you're going to try to get something for Isaiah Simmons, if to your point, he's not going to make your roster. Do you have to make literally 31 individual calls? How does the mechanics work to basically let the league know that, look, we're open to moving this guy. What's your best offer? Well, we, we have contact with 31 clubs 
throughout the preseason, a lot of times you're going to wait to see what injuries that occur, or maybe you were going to move a guy and all of a sudden you lose a guy ahead of him. And then that guy ends up making your roster, but we divided it up amongst our pro department. So mm -hmm. at the time I had George Payton, who was my assistant general manager, who's the general manager out with Denver now, and then our pro director and all our pro scouts. Well, they divided up all the teams. So each of them responsible for five or six teams. Those were the teams that they were communicating with throughout the preseason, uh, talking about potential names as we get closer to the 53 man cut down. So there's been a lot of communication going on and it's divide and conquer because it's hard for like one general manager to sit there and call the other general man, other 31 other GMs. You just don't have enough time in the of day. Course. So you divide and conquer amongst your staff. And then when it gets to the point where, Hey, this may happen. Usually both general managers would jump on, or I would go in and make sure I watched the tape. And then we sat down there and met as a staff. And then we would start the negotiation on a uh, potential trade. All right. So tell me what the process is like. Giants played Saturday night. Cut down day is 4 PM on, on Tuesday. That that's the time that your initial 53 has to be in. What's the process like, as I'm sure it's similar to what you talked about when you're thinking about trading or drafting for a guy, right? You sit down with your coaches and you guys have a joint conversation as to what you're going to do here. So kind of tell the fans and explain to them what it's like for a front office over these very difficult two and a half, three days. Yeah, for the most part, you already know probably your top 40, top 45 going into the final preseason game. It's those final roster spots. You've had personnel meetings with your coaching staff and with your scouting staff throughout the preseason. Uh, identifying maybe some areas that you need to upgrade and then other areas that maybe you have more than enough at the position where you may be able to trade one of those guys. So you kind of go in with the game plan going into this third preseason game. And if you say, let's say you need a backup swing tackle or you need a backup guard or you need a backup linebacker, you're going through 31 other clubs and seeing if they have depth at that position and maybe they'd be willing to move uh, one of those guys. And if you're not willing to trade for them, then those guys are going to be on your radar. So when the 53 man cut down comes across and that wire comes across Tuesday night, that you're already pre kind of prepared to see if those guys that you identified were going to come up, uh, were waived or not waived. Uh, we would sit there and go through every name uh, by the time that uh, wire came across. It's going to be a long night for a lot of personnel departments because going from 90 to 53, I believe the last time that happened was during the COVID year. We had to yeah. keep all 90 players because of the COVID, but usually it was dropped to 75 and then down to 53. So this one's going to be a whole lot of names and it's going to be long nights because as you sit there, you would take each name individually. You go through all of Arizona's cutdowns, for example, and you'd either place them in a potential claim list, you'd like them on your practice squad, a workout list, or we would throw them in the boneyard where we wouldn't have any interest in them at all. So we bro broke them down into categories. If you find a guy that you potentially would claim, uh, we would have maybe three, four, five guys after we went through the seemed like millions of names that night, and then we'd have group studies through the night. So when the coaches came in the morning, I know they're getting ready to game plan, yeah. uh, get ready for the upcoming season. We would say, hey, here are the guys that you guys need to look at. So we'd give them to the coaches. They would evaluate them. And then we would make a decision with myself, the head coach, uh, whether we're going to claim that player or not. And if we put the claim in, hopefully you get them. If you do get them, you have an hour to, to make a roster move. So I remember sometimes we had practice out there. We were having a walkthrough uh, and then you'd have to have, grab a guy coming off the field and saying, Hey, listen, we're going to release you. We're going to try to get you back on practice squad. Uh, once if you do clear waivers, uh, but we just claim this guy. So not only is that initial list of 53, uh, a chance to improve your roster, but when the domino effect happens, if teams start claiming guys, other teams have to come off. So you had a whole nother, a second wave of potential claim guys or guys that you can add to your practice squad. You're ready for a change. Payday comes early with citizens. So go to that retreat. New you moves to the country. 
Now you're raising goats and launching a lifestyle brand. Are you ready for all that life brings? When you're putting your 53 together, how much, Rick, are you anticipating based on those prior conversations you've had maybe and, and other things you know from around the league and contacts, what guys might be let go? Does that influence what you might do for your 53? Or is there too much uncertainty there trying to anticipate who might become available after that cut down day at four o'clock that you can then alter your roster again? Yeah, we have guys on the bubble um, that, A, if, the, if we can replace this guy, we will. But if not, he'll make the 53. The biggest thing you're balancing, too, is a lot of these vested veterans. And if they are on your roster week one, then the, that contract becomes guaranteed, even right. though it's probably minimum. But that's more money out of your cap. So a lot of times you will see teams that release a vested veteran but try to sign them back after week one. The biggest, I guess, parameter that I tried to use is if we decide to cut this young guy and keep this vet, how sick are you going to be if you lose him and someone claims him? So a lot of times you may keep those young guys through the initial wave, let everybody else set their 53 man roster. And then maybe a couple of days later or a day later, uh, try to squeeze him through uh, once everybody kind of gets their roster set, but it's always a cat and mouse game. It's a little bit just like the draft, a guessing game. And to me, it was the hardest three or four days in the entire year, um, e even above the draft, because of the condensed time you have to make those decisions to get through all those names, even though you try to do as much prep work as you possibly can. Uh, but those are a long two or three days uh, you know, to finalize that roster. Yeah, to your point, how are you able to try to anticipate what guys are most likely to not get to your practice squad, right? Guys that you want in the building, but maybe you don't, not sure you want to spend the roster spot on them, but you're afraid they might be, if you're subjected to waivers, they're going to get claimed by somebody else. How does that influence the decision making? And, and how do you gather intel to figure out which guys uh, might have more value to other organizations that they might well, take them if you put them on waivers. <laughs> That's like trying to gather intel before the draft because there's so much smoke right. screen going on out there. So you're just trying to say, listen, we don't want to lose this guy. Let's just keep him on the 53. And just, you know, for example, looking at the Giants, and I don't have a clue of what they were looking at, but they have a lot of receivers. And I was up there at the joint practice with Detroit and, you know, with keeping Shepard and where – uh Robinson is coming off his ACL and, and, uh, but this Ford Wheaton kid would have been a very interesting, unfortunately tore yeah. his ACL this week, but it would have been very interesting, but that would be an example of because he showed up in the preseason, at least he showed up to me when they were up at the combined practices with Detroit, is that kid worth sticking on a 53 or is it worth taking a chance and trying to let him slide through waivers? And unfortunately for him, that was decided when he tore his ACL, but those, that would be a, an example of a decision that you would have to make. Yeah. And they were using him as a gunner a lot on the vice two on punt. He, I think he had a real shot too, before that injury, it's too bad. And and, and that's, that's the uh, great point that you made. A lot of that comes down to these young guys, the fourth, fifth receiver. Uh, and our example was Adam Thielen, you know, where he wasn't Adam Thielen that we know today. He was a guy that we signed as a college free agent and, he ended up, we ended up cutting him, getting him on a practice squad, but it was a real tough decision because he was a valuable asset, not only as a player, even though he wasn't ready as a receiver, but he was a very good special teamer. And when we had an injury during the season, we brought him up off our practice squad. I think he ended up blocking a punt against Carolina when we were playing in the University of Minnesota's uh, stadium that year. And then the rest was history. And it's funny, you mentioned the wide receiver position. The Giants did do some early releases on Saturday, including one of the wide receivers, Colin Johnson. And Brian Dable had a quote saying, look, we think Colin's a good player. We just really like our room. We want to give him an opportunity to maybe latch on with the team. So when you're releasing these guys early, Rick, a lot of the time, is that a favor to these players to, to let other teams know that he's available early to give him a better chance of catching on elsewhere? And what other reasons might there be to release a guy a little bit earlier in the process rather than waiting until four o'clock on Tuesday. 
Well, one is if I think that's a fair assessment, if he's not going to be on your roster or on your practice squad to give them an opportunity, at least to have some teams look at him. Um, but if I'm trying to get a guy through my practice squad, I don't want to put his name on that list till he's blended in with 8 million other names. You know, I don't want him to stick out like a sore thumb. Oh yeah. We were watching this. It's take a couple of days to go back and look, but it does give guys that you know that are probably not going to make your football team or make your practice squad. Uh, it gives them an opportunity to get out there and get a little uh, early. And then when you have to go from 90 to 53 and you're speaking to each one of those individuals, that's another very long emotional day uh, too, uh, that, that really, really takes a lot out of you mentally. You mentioned the practice squad, you went through it where you saw the practice squad grow and grow and grow and the rules around it expanded, right? You could keep more veterans on it now than you could before. How does the changing practice squad and how did it impact you when you were putting your rosters together knowing that, you know, you can call guys up now. So maybe you can have a developmental guy in the 53 that you can now supplement with a guy you call from the practice squad each week. How did that change your thinking on putting your roster together? Yeah, I was part of the, uh, I was co-chair with Tom Telesco of the GM committee and, and all that kind of came out of the COVID year. And when we yep. had to keep extra, we made all these exceptions, I want to say exceptions, new type of rules on how you can protect guys, bring them up and down. But the other advantage was for the veterans, um, you know, so I don't want to expose this young guy because veterans um, that are four years, they don't have to go through the waiver wire uh, so, until, you know, halfway through the season and after the uh, trade deadline, then those veterans go through a waiver. But at the beginning, they're just free agents. So we can really say that we'll cut that veteran put him on practice squad in order to keep that young guy that we don't want to get exposed. The Giants huddle is brought to you by citizens, the official bank of the giants from game day to everyday citizens is made ready for giant fans with insights, guidance, and solutions. Learn more at citizensbank.com. Rick, how do you grade players during the preseason? Is it like literally a grade for every practice grades for preseason? How do you just bring all that scouting and self scouting you've done over the course of the summer to, to really, you know, stack these guys and figure out which guys are better, more valuable. I just, how does that internal process work? Are you talking about with like, for example, what the Giants are doing with the Giants players? Or yes, with correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you look at your own roster over okay. the course of the, of the summer. Yeah, no, that starts back in the OTAs when they start coming in. Um, and you know what they are because you did all of their college evaluation. And then you start to assess where they're at, where the development is as you go through the OTAs and the mini camps and then what they do when they come into training camp. I think the biggest thing that separates guys from making it and not making it are one, the value that they can potentially bring to special teams. And two is can the coaches trust them if they have to go into a game and get on the field? So are they learning the system? Do they know what to do? Um, and so that's not only just in preseason games, but that's through the out every practice. And we would have meetings, personnel meetings, at least once or twice a week, uh, assessing where each guy is, if they're improving or if they're not improving. And uh, that's where you, you really get the true evaluation. It's not, okay, we'll see what he does in the last preseason game. That may be a final checkbox next to him. But there was an assessment done since he started when he walked in the first day of rookie minicamp. You mentioned special teams, and you're right, it's vital. How do you balance a guy that you know can be a big teams player, but maybe your coaches is like, you know, we really don't want to put this guy in the field on defense. That could be a problem. But, man, he's going to help us on specials. How many types of those guys can you even keep? Because you do need X number of numbers at each position. You can actually run on offense and defense, right? Right. Well, that, that comes down when you're talking through this is okay. When we are on what, what is our 46 man roster going to look like week one? And if this guy is a core contributor on special teams, I mean, that's still part of the game, although it seems like the beginning eliminated every year. I think maybe it's only punt and punt return left what they have to do. Um, but that can be a, a vital sign on if a guy makes it. And it could be, let's say, a rookie who's maybe behind a veteran at a position, 
Um, but you're anticipating that he's going to help you week one on special teams is going to be one of your core special teams player. And you also have to project that by week six or seven, this rookie may be as good or better than that veteran that we keep. So, uh, or it could be a veteran. Listen, I know he knows what to do. He can get us through a game, uh, but he's one of our core guys on special teams, but you can't have just, you know, 10 of those guys on your roster. So usually the number comes down to maybe two or three, three or four uh, that end up being core special teams players for you that, but they have to be able to go function in the game if they had to be used. Last question on, on this topic before we get to a little NFL season preview here, Rick, before we say goodbye. And again, thanks so much for the time. How much do you marry yourself to we need X number of players at each position? And when you get down to, well, yeah, we we really think we need that fourth tight end, let's say, but that seventh wide receiver is just a much better player. What's What are those conversations like as a front office when you're having those with the coaching staff? Those are the difficult ones because – Anyone you decide to keep, there's one that's falling off to get to the 53. So, and then that's where that special teams comes in. So that fourth tight end, um, and it may come down to, hey, listen, we have three tight ends that are going to be out of contract next year. Right. Uh, so you have to weigh that in or the assessment on, okay, this receiver is a veteran, but this rookie tight end is going to be a really good player for us. So you may lean towards the younger guy. Plus you have to take in all of your cap consideration and where you're at in the cap, because you have to have a cushion in your cap. And we used to use a two to $3 million cushion just to get through the season. So if you lose players, you know, you have replacement player costs, you have to pay for your practice squad. You have to get through a season. So everybody thinks no one's is up just at the cap. Uh, when a 53 comes down to it, uh, you have to have enough cushion to make sure that you can pay for your practice squad, replacement players, potential injury settlements. There are a lot of things that you have to budget for that aren't anticipated, but you have to have enough room in your cap to get through a season. Yeah, now even activating those practice squad players on a game day, right? That's even yep. more money that you have to account for, right? Yep. That's why you have to have make sure that you're anticipating the cushion that you need uh, to get through a season. Giant fans love a winner. It's why they love Citizens, named the 2022 Best Bank in the U.S. by The Banker as the official bank of the Giants and sponsor of the Huddle Citizens is made ready for fans of Big Blue. Learn more at CitizensBank.com. You love turf. You're good at it. So you start a turf biz. Business grows your savings grow. Become the most celebrated name in turf. Are you ready for all that life brings? Rick, as, as you well know, doing this for so long, how a team figures out their quarterback and who their quarterback is has such a big impact on whether or not they're going to be a consistent winner. Giants had a big decision to make with Daniel Jones this offseason. Just wondering from your perspective, how you think they handled it? Did they do the right thing? And, and how things look for Big Blue with Daniel now locked up on that four-year deal moving forward? Yeah, I thought he did a phenomenal job last year. And the one, one thing that really surprised me was I knew he was a good athlete, but I didn't realize how good an athlete he was and how he was able to make plays with his legs. And because of that, defenses have to account for his mobility. You know, he's not just a pocket passer. So that added one element to his game that defenses had to worry about. Now you get Saquon Barkley in there, and I think the biggest addition they could have made was getting Waller in at tight end because of what he's going to do in a passing game. And I think they have enough weapons around Daniel Jones now uh, that he's going to be a very good quarterback. They had a year to assess him. I know they didn't exercise, I don't believe, the fifth-year option on him. So uh, they had a whole year to be around him and they made that organizational decision that he was our quarterback going forward. And the one thing you would ask yourself in those meetings after you assess him is if not him, who? And I don't know if after you get through those first four, three or four picks that were in the draft, is there another rookie quarterback that's going to do what Jan Daniel Jones did for us last year? And you're building off of something where you came out and probably surprised a lot of people on how good your team was, how well coached they were, um, that you don't want to take a step back. You want to keep growing and moving forward. And I think Daniel Jones earned the contract he got 
uh, on the way he performed last year. And I believe Joe and coach really felt that too, or else they wouldn't have done that deal. And I'm sure you, I mean, you scattered him obviously, but I'm sure at the joint practice, you notice Daniel has gotten a lot bigger too, like upper body. He's bulked up. He's a strong guy. I think he's done that in preparation to handle a lot of that running stuff that you were talking about too. Yeah, but you want to keep him healthy too. Of so, course. Yeah. <laughs> Just no like two down it. in the Miami get bulked up too, but you still want to make sure they're still going to take hits no matter how big they are and they still have to stay healthy. If, if it isn't a key third down, get down and slide. I think that's the message <laughs> for the quarterbacks, no question. Uh, you mentioned Saquon earlier. Uh, you you did this with Dalvin Cook in Minnesota, right? How tough is it to handle running backs that are elite players and you love them in the building heading into that second contract, given kind of where that market has developed? Well, it's different than it was maybe even four or five years ago. My first draft, our first pick was Adrian Peterson. And he, That's was, right. he was the whole focus of our offense. So we didn't look at it as a running back. We looked at it as... Uh, can this guy score points for us uh, when he has the ball in his hands? And I think Saquon fits into that category. But since the success of some of these later round guys, and now it seems to be the theory that uh, you don't spend money on that position. It was funny. I talked to during coaching interviews. One of the things that I would ask was if you had four positions that you had to pay on offense top end money or the top money in the market what four would you pick and of course it was receiver was left tackle was quarterback um but in the past it's always been running back i talked to a lot of these young offensive coordinators or i think young guys that will be offensive coordinators in a couple years from now none of them said running back was a place they would put their money all of a sudden shifted to tight end tight end right yeah that's what i figured so now it seems like because Kansas City goes out and wins a Super Bowl and they, with Pacheco and they get a, you know, well, is that an anomaly or is that the way a trend in is? But I think with the way the NFL game has evolved and you're seeing a lot more three wide receiver sets, it's not so much with a fullback or two tight ends, um, you know, in a running back getting the ball 25, 30 touches a game. Now it seems like the ball is getting spread out more. And it seems like if you have an impact receiver, that those are the guys that are having the biggest impact on the game. You know, whether it's a, 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 you know, A.J. Brown in Philadelphia, and look what he did for Hurts, Tyreek Hill, what he did for Tua, you know, even Justin Jefferson up in Minnesota and what an impact he has. And Lord knows what his contract's going to come in looking like by the time he's ready to get one. So, uh, but I do believe that, like when you have a unique talent like a Saquon Barkley, but add in the fact that he's a great character guy, that he's a great culture fit in the locker room, that he's going to do everything right, that he represents your organization the right way, both on and off the field, that has some value in my opinion. Maybe I'm old school, but I think that adds some value to the uh, to, to the contract as well. Yeah, I would say no question about it. And just from a league kind of pattern perspective, Rick, I'm I'm interested to get your take. Do you think we're going to see maybe some more fullback stuff, going back to some more gap gap scheme stuff as these teams, there's so many of these Fangio disciples, right, that run these shell defenses, safeties back, it's light boxes. Are we going to see teams get back maybe away from some of the outside zone stuff and more towards that straight ahead gap scheme power running attack? I don't, I think that it depending on, if you're keeping the example you gave earlier, uh, four tight ends. Sometimes those tight ends can fill that role instead of just keeping a fullback that you have a dual position guy. And I think that's tremendous value. And that also, and I didn't mention that earlier, comes down to I'm making a 53 or not. If you can play multi positions or do multiple things for him. But if you have a fullback that can also fill that void or a tight end that could also play a fullback type role, whether it's, you know, motion him in the backfield or most whatever creative ways these offensive coordinators are going to use them, that gives you some flexibility to do some of the things that you're talking about. How much of the Giants do you think closed the gap with Dallas and Philly in the NFC East? They made the playoffs last year, won a playoff game. It was, it was a successful year in the first year of the regime of Dable and Shane. 
but they were still kind of a ways back from from Philly and Dallas, right? Do you think they've closed the gap talent wise? Yeah, I, I do. I really do. It's still going to be a uh, huge challenge because I think the NFC East is probably the toughest division of football right now. And I wouldn't uh, what Washington commanders look like during the preseason. I think they're going to be a better football team as well. So that is a very, very tough divi- division. You can't predict injuries going into the season. But I do think the Giants and Joe Shane has done enough uh, to really close the gap, whether their roster is physical, you know, just going man per man. Are they better than Philadelphia or Dallas right now? I don't know if they reached that category yet, but they have closed the gap. All right. And then then final question, just kind of what do you see the Giants trajectory here? Big picture in the NFC. It's kind of unlike the AFC, Rick. It's a wide open conference. You don't have the Burroughs and the Mahomeses and the Herberts and the Lawrences. I think there's a bunch of more Rogers go down the list, right? Just what do you see the trajectory of the franchise? What should fan expectations be this year? And and kind of what are the next steps they need to take to become Super Bowl contenders? Yeah, I think that they are are, are going uh, moving in the right direction after having a few down years. Uh, I think Debo is one of, is a great coach, uh, and what the culture and what the discipline he's brought to that football team, and Joe has done a phenomenal job bringing in the personnel. And as long as that coaching staff and the front office can marry that personnel together to bring in not only good football players, but high quality, high character people, which seems like that's what they're accomplishing, that that'll continue to grow. But there's no reason why they shouldn't be back in the playoff uh, again this year. And again, I'm not, uh, you know, you can't predict the injuries if something gets hurt, but if they stay healthy, they should have a playoff football team this year. Rick, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for doing it. We love to have you on the offseason again, maybe for free agency in the draft and pick your GM brain as you get into that part of the offseason. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me on today. Rick Spielman, former Vikings GM on the Giants Little Podcast. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next time.